Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. We'd like to tell you the story of a woman who worshipped a man who was wrong. The woman is Theodosia Burr. The man, her father, Aaron Burr. In the American way of life, Burr was wrong. He dreamed of an empire in what was to become part of the United States. Yet his daughter Theodosia, knowing the evil, to say nothing of the folly of her father's ambitions, believed in him almost to the end. Why? The answer to that question lies in our play, which Robert Tallman wrote for the Cavalcade Players. Our star is Anne Sterrett. The orchestra and the original musical score are under the direction of Don Voorhees. DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry, presents Anne Starrett as Theodosia Burr on the Cavalcade of America. Eve of the year 1800. In the stately dining room of the mansion house of a country estate in lower Manhattan, the host, a handsome, magnetic little man in maroon waistcoat and fluffy white stock, is proposing traditional New Year toasts. He is Aaron Burr. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I offer a third and final toast to the next president of these United States, the one who will make us great, who, God willing, will open for us the great empire that lies to the Colonel west. Burr. Yes, General Hamilton? Your hospitality tonight has afforded me much pleasure. I trust I shall have no occasion to alter that view. I believe I was merely proposing a toast, sir. Colonel Burr, you well know my views on Thomas Jefferson. You only seek to provoke me. General Hamilton. This is not the first occasion, sir. General Hamilton. My apologies, Miss Theodosia. I feel very strongly in this matter. But, General Hamilton, how do you know Father's toast was to be Thomas Jefferson? Why, I... Why, his democratic sympathies are notorious. But, General Hamilton, I thought we all believed in democracy. Well, I... When you put it that way, Miss Theodosia... Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if my father will permit it, I should like to suppose the next toast. Of course they are, my dear. To the next president of these United States. The one who will open for us the great empire that lies in the West. A toast, ladies and gentlemen, to the great unknown. <laughs> well, well spoken, Miss Theo. And now let us drink once more, good people, to Miss Theodosia Burr, diplomat extraordinary, the wisest and most beautiful of American politicians. <laughs> Magnificent, they are. Magnificent. You knew that General Hamilton would forget his political principles in the presence of a woman's beauty. And, Father, you promised me you'd hold your temper with General Hamilton. Ah, you're right, Theo, you're right. We can't afford to antagonize anyone just now. But when this election is over, General Hamilton will discover that... That you are the author of a great political revolution. The guiding genius of the Democratic Party. So why bother with petty personal quarrels? Hmm. <laughs> Again, you anticipate me, Theo. But it won't be easy. The election laws favor the property owners. And here in New York, those property owners are cheaply federalists. Father, I was thinking, how much property must a man possess in order to vote? Any amount. What are you driving at, Theo? Well, here on our farm, for instance. Couldn't we deed over just enough land to our tenants to give each of them the vote. And couldn't other Democrats do the same? Theo! You found the answer. Of course. Why didn't I think of that before? New York is in our hands. Oh, but, Father, that still might not be enough to win. Oh, it will, the way I'm going to do it. I get Swart out. He has a social club called Tammany. And it has a clubhouse called the Wigwam. We'll buy more clubhouses, one in every district. 
And everyone who joins becomes a part owner and also a voter. But if these new members of Tammany have no property in the first place, how are they to purchase a share in one of these new clubhouses? We'll give it them. And where will you get the money for such a venture? Oh, I'll raise a campaign fund. I... Oh, that won't be enough. Theo will need money. A great deal of money. Joseph Alston. He's one of the richest men in the South. Theo, you'll invite Joseph Alston here to tea tomorrow. Tomorrow? Oh, but I've already invited Washington Irving for tomorrow, Father. Put him off, Theo, and see Joseph Alston tomorrow. For me. All right, Father, if you insist. Thank you, my dear. I was sure that you would. This time, play the whole exercise through without stopping. Oh, sorry. I can't keep my mind on the music today, Natalie. Hmm, you are thinking about young Washington Irving, no? Perhaps. But your father tells you to see Monsieur Austin, so love flies out the window. Come, sir. Oh, you're wrong, Natalie. I'm not in love. Not really. But I do know Father needs me. He will always need you. When was it ever any different? When I first came to live in this house just after your mother's death, I found you playing hostess at the age of 12. I know, but how could I help it? Now, at 17, you become manager of a political campaign. Why do you not do something for yourself before it is too late? How can I? Without him, I'm nothing. He taught me all I know. Not your beauty and not your wisdom. Can you be content with such gifts, never to have any life of your own? Yes, more than content. If it should help my father realize his greatness. Yes, what is it, Pompey? Uh, Miss Theo, Mars Alston has arrived. Oh, I'll meet him on the terrace, Pompey. Yes, Miss Theo. Coming along, Natalie? Oh, thank you, no. I think I stay with my music. Mademoiselle, remember what I said. Miss Theo. Welcome to Richmond Hill Farm, Mr. Alston. How delighted I was to receive your invitation. And how surprised. How very lovely it is out here. You like our Manhattan springtime, Mr. Alston? I find it a bit chilly, Miss. Oh, you'd rather go inside? No, no, not at all. I was just admiring the view of the river from here. The Hudson. How I love it. Can you believe it, Mr. Alston? Father thinks Manhattan Island will someday be an enormous city. Like London. Oh, Paris. Indeed, he may be right. I'm told that more and more of the Boston trade puts in here these days. Mm. And I suppose you're eager to get back home to your plantations, Mr. Alston. I have remained thus long only in the hope of seeing you again. You flatter me, sir. How lovely you look today. And you seem changed. Before you were so cold, so distant. I didn't mean to be, Mr. Alston. Truly, I didn't. I, uh, that is, Father and I shall miss you most often. Oh, I had no idea Colonel Burr held me in so high regard. Oh, he does indeed, Mr. Alston. He thinks of you as by almost as his own son. Theo, if you could only know what happiness those words have given me. Oh, Mr. Alston, please, I, I didn't mean that. Oh, oh, there's Father, coming up the drive. Hello. Greetings, Alston. How are you, Colonel? Well, sir, that's a handsome mount you have there. Uh, southern horse flesh, Mr. Alston. The best. Like to take him for a canter? Round the drive? Privilege, sir. Stirrups may be a bit high for you. Oh, they'll serve, I believe. Uh -huh. Join you in a moment, Miss Theo. Careful. He's spirited. Theo, how'd it go? Father, I, I'm afraid I've made a terrible blunder. You offended him? Oh, worse. Much worse. But... I told him you thought of him almost as a son, and I believe he took it for a proposal. Good. When's the wedding to be? Wedding? Well, surely you mean to accept him, Theo. Of course not. I don't love him. And besides, I'd have to live down there. In South Carolina. Away from you, Father. Oh, you'll get used to it. Married couples aren't always in love at first, Theo. You talk as if it were already decided. You will decide it, Theo. Because I trust your mind as if it were my own. <laughs> Oh, 
Father, please stop pacing so. Sit down, relax. <sighs> Sorry, Theo, I'm all on edge. After these months of campaigning, I'm exhausted. Well, all your worry won't get Mr. Swart out here any sooner with the election return. Uh, here comes Mr. Swart out now, Colonel. At oh. last, I have news for you, Colonel. Yes, yes, what is it, Mr. Swart? Huh? We've carried New York City by some 500 votes. Thanks to your brilliant strategy, Colonel Burr, and Mr. Alston's generous contribution, we've won New York. And those electoral votes will elect Jefferson. Is it final and certain? Even the opposition admits it. And, sir, you are acclaimed the greatest man in the party. The greatest next to Mr. Jefferson. The greatest next to Mr. Jefferson? Yes, Miss Theo. They already talk of your father as the next vice president. Well, perhaps the vice presidency isn't a poor beginning. Let's drink to it. Indeed, Colonel. And uh, I would like to toast two happy events. To Miss Theo, your betrothal to Mr. Alston. And to you, Colonel, your great victory for the Democratic Party. Thank you, Mr. Swarthout. I rejoice that the party is won. Oh, those horrible night sounds beginning again. Isn't it ever any different on this dreary plantation, Natalie? Close the window. Shut it out. Madame, I do not like it any better than you. But I say it is my job. I am philosophical. Your job is wife to Monsieur Alston. Voila. And I'm homesick, Natalie. For New York. And father. Lie down and try to get some rest, my little one. I get my sewing and bring it here to keep you company. Your sweet Natalie. Monsieur Alston. I must speak to you urgently. Leave the room, Mademoiselle, at once. Certainly, Monsieur. Good night, Madame. Joseph, have you gone mad? Speaking to Natalie like that, bursting into my room without knocking... And who has a better right? Now, listen to this. Listen carefully. It's an item in a New York paper that just arrived. Alexander Hamilton foully assassinated by Aaron Burr. Under the cloak of the Code Duello, the iniquitous vice president has at last fiendishly done away with the archenemy to his schemes and intrigues against the Republic. The glorious soldier and statesman, General Alexander Hamilton. Joseph, give me that paper. For this, I poured my inheritance into your wretched father's career. To bring disgrace on my family. Oh, but this is just a Federalist account of it, Joseph. Hamilton was always provoking, Father. It must have been a matter of honor. What does your father know of honor? Didn't he gain his present lofty position by intrigue and conniving every step of the way? You call it intrigue. I call it brilliant strategy. And marrying you off to me against your will. That was brilliant strategy, too, wasn't it? Joseph, you knew. You thought me so stupid. I did love you. I hoped I could make you love me. At any rate, I told myself the marriage did credit to my family. And now this. I married you to help my father of my own free will, Joseph. And I'd do it again. Aaron Burr is a great man. I'd think so even if he weren't my father. Then go back to him. You hate it here so much, go on back. You'd really like to turn me out, wouldn't you? Save your face with your fat, pompous friends. Theo. But you can't. Because that man you hate so, Aaron Burr, is going to have a grandchild. It's funny, isn't it? Isn't it, Joseph? Theo, I must remind you. The name of our son will be Alston, not Burr. And he'll be my son, not Aaron Burr's. Remember that, Theo. Colonel Burr, madame, your father, he's here. My father? Theo. My own little Theo. Oh, how did you get here, father? I thought... Yes. I'm still a fugitive from what they choose to call justice. But I have plans, Theo. Great plans. Now, where's my grandchild, Theo? Oh, come, I'll let you see him. Oh, so much has happened, father. What, you mean my shooting, Alexander Hamilton? You sound so callous. Why not? Hamilton was finished long before that duel. When I shot him, I did him a favor. I made him a great man. Where's this grandson of mine? Oh, here's the nursery, Father. He's sleeping, so be quiet. Yes, of course. Oh, yes. Yes, he's a bird, all right. We christened him there. For you, Father. 
Must begin his lesson soon, Theo. We can't even talk yet, Father. Uh, he will soon. You knew both Latin and French at two and a half. Little Burr must be taught Spanish above all. Remember that, Theo. Spanish? Why Spanish, Father? Because he'll inherit a great empire one day, Theo. And his subjects will speak Spanish. Father, what are you talking about? Listen, Theo. I have plans to liberate the West from Spain. And when I have, I shall be emperor. And you, a princess royal. And this little man, the heir to a great crown. Father, that doesn't sound like you. Doesn't sound like us. You question my plan? I do. Ought not the West to be joined to the United States when it's liberated? Surely its people want democracy. This country breaks off at the Alleghenies. It must be two or more nations. And as for democracy, I don't savor that pack yelling for my blood in Washington. I was wrong when I credited the common people with intelligence. Oh, but Father, that doesn't sound like you. This is wild. I, I hate to think of you believing it. Oh, come along with me, my princess, to where my armies are gathering, to the west. I can't. There's Joseph. What about my husband? You've handled Joseph before, Theo. You can do it again for me. Very well, Father. I'll do it for you. Where are we now, Father? The Ohio River Road. A secret landing just ahead where you see that lantern. Father, there's a man coming out on the road. He has a gun. It's all right, Theo. Oh! Who goes there? Water! Go! It's all right, Sentry. It's I, Bob. Oh, Your Majesty. I'm sorry, sire. This is my daughter. We leave as soon as possible. Her Royal Highness is prettier than I dared to hope, Your Majesty. Thank you, Sentry. Be careful, Theo. Hold that lantern a little higher, if you please. How carefully you're putting here, Theo. There's a gangplank. Where did you get the money to build such a boat, Father? From you, my little gold mine, we're going to have a fleet of them. Joseph, you made him sell one of the plantations. Yes. It was an investment on his part. But that man, calling you your majesty, calling oh, me... Oh, you'll get used to that where we're going. Well, who are these people we're going to stay with? The Blennerhassets. Fabulously wealthy couple. They built a great chateau on an island down this river, a palace in the wilderness. They're a bit eccentric, Theo. But they're useful to me in establishing a western empire. And I give them what they want. What do they want? They want to live in a dream. And you, Father? What about you? Isn't that what you want? Your Majesty... How much longer are we going to have to wait for these armies of yours to materialize? Now, don't rush His Majesty Harmon. After all, an empire can't be built in a day. Rome wasn't, you know. I suppose not, but... Blood it. Going just as fast as I can. The moment Jefferson declares war on Spain, we... But we, we... can't be absolutely sure Jefferson will declare war, Father. Supposing he doesn't. I suppose he doesn't, Your Majesty. Then we'll float what forces and supplies we have down to New Orleans. And join General Wilkinson's army there. The Spanish border forces are exceedingly small. After all, but... Harmon, what's a few thousand pounds to all the gold of the Aztecs? And the ambassadorship to the court of St. James. Listen. What? Listen. What's that? A marauder. Landing on my island. Fetch me my musket. I said get me my musket. I distinctly heard a marauder. My way. No, I no, no, it's there. Just no, our can't... prince consort. Prince Hart, Duke, what nonsense. Theo, go and pack your things. You're coming home with me at once. Joseph, you will remember your manners. I'm sorry, Theo. Colonel Burr, madam, but there's no time to lose. Joseph, it's no use. I'm going to New Orleans with father. Theo, you're mad. They're talking of arresting the whole lot of you for treason. You're not safe here. I'm safe wherever my father is, Joseph. You've done this to her, Burr. Taken her away from her home, her child, to follow this crazy dream. You have her hypnotized. Hypnotized, Austin? Hardly, my dear fellow. Theo is a woman with a mind of her own. You tried to fit her into your narrow little world, but she was too big for it. Now you come here gibbering about hypnosis. Go on back to your swamp. 
Phil and I have had enough of you. Whether she's interested in me or not, she should know her son has been ill. Dangerously ill. I don't believe it. Father, I have something to say about this. Care for what you say. Our fate is in your hands, Your Royal Highness. Oh, do be quiet. Joseph, is he all right now? He's better now, but the fever may recur at any time. Theo, can't you see this is just a device of this rascal to lure you back? I don't care if it is. I want to see my little boy. And I'm sick of all this royalty rubbish. You're living in a dream. All of you. But... Yes, you too, Father. My little boy is sick. He needs me. That's real. People are real. Can't you see how empty it makes all this? Very well. You may go to your child, Theo, but remember, when the Empire is established, I expect you to fulfill your obligations. Well, I won't. I hope there never is any Empire. I hope you fail. Theo! You really mean this? I really mean it. That's the only thing that ever could have made me fail, Theo. The only thing. What's that you got there, Mummy? It's a present. Near Gandhi Burr. It's a musical box. Listen. Oh, it's pretty. Very pretty. When will I see Gampy again, Mummy? I don't know, darling. Your Gampy's in terrible trouble. You've put him in jail, and they're saying things about him that aren't true. Why don't you go and tell them the truth, Mummy? Well, maybe I will. If Daddy thinks it's all right. Yes, it's all right, Theo. Joseph, I didn't hear you come in. I heard what you said, Theodosia. I will carry out my part of this, this compact we pledge our lives to. I'll go with you to your father's trial in Richmond. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you. Case of the United States versus Aaron Burr, charged with treason and misdemeanor. Judge Marshall presiding. The jury will rise. Gentlemen of the jury, how do you find? Because no act of overt treason has been proved in this court, the jury finds the defendant not guilty. Not guilty because not proved guilty. Your Honor, I object. Yes, Colonel Burr. I'm either guilty or not guilty. I demand that the verdict be rendered in the proper form. The verdict will stand. But the clerk will record the simple verdict of not guilty. Court adjourned. Father. Theo, my dear. Congratulations, Burr. Thank you, Joseph. What will you do now, Father? I can't stay here, that's certain. Perhaps England will have me for a while, and then France for a while. When I run out of countries, maybe they'll let me come home. I wish I could go with you. No, Theo, you go back with Joseph. You two forget about me. I've been bad luck to you, as I've been to everybody. Goodbye. God bless you both. Oh, Father. Goodbye, Theo. Goodbye, sir, and thank you. Funny he's admitting that after all these years. Admitting what, Joseph? About his being bad luck to everybody. Bad luck? My father? Never to me, Joseph. I'd rather not live than not be the daughter of Aaron Burr. Theodosia Burr followed her father's fateful star with a deep devotion and glowing faith. Through her wise decision in his great crisis, we of today are better able to understand the brilliant but tragic destiny that overshadowed Aaron Burr. Cavalcade of America thanks Ann Starrett and the Cavalcade players 
for their performance of the story of Theodosia Burr. And now DuPont brings you news of chemistry at work in our world. To every one of the 70 million tons of steel America is making this year, chemistry is adding its contribution. To name just one chemical used in steel making, in the hot pickling bath that clean steel blooms, the steel industry will use more than 900,000 tons of sulfuric acid this year. There's a story in those pickling baths that reveals the extreme accuracy with which the modern chemist works. The problem is to remove the scale without harming the steel. Acid will attack scale, but it bites into metal, too. So DuPont chemists added a specially devised inhibitor to the acid. DuPont sulfuric acid, containing small amounts of this chemical inhibitor, takes off the scale picked up by the sheets and bars during the rolling operation in such a way that the acid works only on the scale, not on the metal. Chemistry lends an invaluable helping hand all along the steel production line. DuPont alkali cleaners and degreasing solvents take off dirt and grease, speeding production, cutting costs, and preparing the metal for finishes. DuPont fluxes and acids help with galvanizing, tinning, and soldering. Tens of thousands of welding rods in use today owe their efficiency to DuPont silicate and titanium dioxide. Another thing chemistry does for steel is protect it. Chromium plate, one of the hardest electroplate surfaces known, is added to steel with the help of DuPont chromic acid. You know what chemical protection of this kind means in your own home. Not only plumbing fixtures, but toasters, washing machine and refrigerator parts, electric irons, scissors, even needles are chemically plated with metals that don't rust. The same sort of chemical plating is vital to industry. Think of a tool, for instance, say a high-speed drill. Machine shops today have drills whirling at speeds that would have been impossible a few years ago. They stand the gaff because their surface is plated with chromium. Thanks to chemistry again, it's possible nowadays to make steel hard on the outside and tough on the inside. Suppose you're cutting a set of gears. The teeth must have a hard, wear-resistant surface and tough, shock-resisting core. Here's what they do. They cut the gears out of steel that has the required qualities. Then they treat it with DuPont cyanides. The process is called case hardening. The result is an outer wear surface harder than glass around a core that's tough and strong. Steel is the pillar on which our modern civilization rests. Always important to us, it's of greater importance today than ever before. The direction of history itself may turn on the capacity of America to make steel, steel, and more steel. Standing shoulder to shoulder with the men of steel are the chemists who bring us, in the words of the DuPont Pledge, better things for better living through chemistry. And now the star of next week's program, John McIntyre of the Cavalcade Players. When the Alamo fell in defense of liberty, America lost Davy Crockett. He died, as a great many others, for freedom. He was a frontiersman, as were many others, who helped build this modern America. Today, the crackle of his pistols, the voice that rang out over the plains of Texas, are stilled. But Davy Crockett remains one of the best-loved heroes and legends. We hope you'll listen to his story on next week's Cavalcade of America. On the Cavalcade of America, your announcer is Clayton Collier, sending best wishes from DuPont. This is the National Broadcasting Company.